I'm Rachel Jankovic. you? I'm Becca. And we're back. Yeah, we are. To talk more about life. We're back from a different locale this time. Mm, overlooking the University of Idaho back half of the golf course <laughs> and the wood chipper pile on the other side. <laughs> we like to have a view, you know. <laughs> we like to see what we can see. Isn't that um, the wood chips that go to the power plant? Yeah, I think so. But we tried our normal spot. We ran in Goodwill. I bought an ugly coffee table, and then I got theater shoes. Which what? Think, the the book theater shoes oh. by Noel Strapfield. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ooh. I'm not going into musical theater at any time soon. Well, I was just we already what kind had of shoes that book, that book. But I think it's been well it used like, and abused. Is it like ballet shoes? Is yeah, the there's like a bunch of shoes. There's ballet shoes, yeah. theater shoes, we, yeah. dancing shoes, maybe. Oh, yeah. a friend gave us ballet shoes in England, and my girls read it, but I never. The weird part about those books is I think they were written in the. I want to say the 40s. Yeah, I think so. And they're good books, but the new printings, the covers, and they look like something you would never, ever buy Mm. because it's all about following her dreams of being... Like, the blurbs and stuff are not at all relevant to the book. Wait, on this subject, this is not at all on point, but while we were in England, we did bump into some um, children's books that we had just never run across here, but one of them was... um, Oh, this is good. Now I'm blanking out on what it was. You, your, your kids have read them. <laughs> you're talking it's about the, the Famous Five? No, or the... the Famous Five. We love the Famous Five. Those are really fun, but they're hard to find here in the States. No, it's the one um, that Lewis talks about at the beginning of Magician's Nephew. The Treasure oh, Seekers. Treasure Seekers. The Treasure yeah. Seekers. That's Ian Nesbitt, right? Ian Nesbitt. And it was such a hoot to read that one and then be like, wait, this is from the opening lines well, of talks Magician's about... Nephew. When the Bastables were looking for treasure in the Lewisham Road. Yeah. And we, this friend recommended the book and we like, got wait. it and it was like, Hey, they're looking for treasure in the Lewis yeah. road. No way. Anyway, it's that's exciting. But times. the point is we did that and then we were going to go to our usual lookout spot, but there was a creepy Winnebago. Park we turned there. to turn to go up the hill and there's a big rundown <laughs> RV parked up there. We thought, no, no, never mind. They're probably peddling. They're probably something. No, they're up the there door. recording their weird podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking coffee Drinking and overlooking coffee. the vistas of Moscow. Anyway, Auto. now we're looking out over the golf course. It's a bit greener than the Goodwill roof, but yeah, it's looking good. Anyway, so we thought today we should talk about why, when we spend so much time talking about curtains and bread and knitting and socks and so it's just the domestic, we talk about the domestic, domestic because that's our life, really. I mean, that's what largely, we're doing. yeah. Um, and then we were wondering, or you may be wondering, we thought we should reflect on why New St. Andrews College is hosting this podcast. Yeah, why? Why did we do it with them? Or why are, well, yeah, they're like, putting up with us and our giant little... giant mixed metaphor is the question. Yeah, like, why are we here at NSA talking about the domestic? Is like, is women in college and women's intellectual, yeah. theological pursuit somehow dis- dissonant with all the domestic? Yeah, with... Like, should we not be talking about NSA, but rather Taste of Home magazine? Is that like, <laughs> like what things? Oh. It's like it's like one of those early elementary worksheets where you have the pictures of things, and it's like, what does not belong what in this picture? Belong. What doesn't belong? Does anything not belong? That's the yeah. question. Like, and how do we harmonize these? Right, things? and for us, we would say no. This all belongs like, together. Of course, it belongs. And the thing is, both of us are uh, graduates of New St. Andrews, and if You have never heard of New St. Andrews. Well, you should. That's the first thing. First step. But it's a liberal arts education, so both of us had to sit through years of theology, philosophy, Latin, Greek. We did. We even did more than sit through it. We 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 read. We listened. We wrote papers. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. History and literature, and um, yeah, a year of theology. Well, two years really of theology, if you think about that. You know. Um, Anyway, it's a great program. It's a fantastic program for guys and for girls. Both both of us, um, I think it's safe to say, both of us use uh, what we got at New St. Andrews 
daily. And it doesn't matter um, if that day is spent doing the laundry or right. if that day is researching for a talk we have to give. Our and own. I would say, well, I'm very thankful that I went to NSA and I have that degree. It's not that I needed to have had the degree to still harmonize wanting to learn about God, know about God, pursuing all of the beautiful things in the world and then also being domestic, being at home and raising my kids and not feeling like I'm not being fulfilled or I'm not using the best. I think people often act like at home is your worst side. And if you really ever want to live your A game, you have to be doing it outside yeah, you of the do home. It somewhere else. Like, because at home, all you could be doing really is wearing a Snuggie <laughs> and... Well, no, I mean, there is this perception that at home is where you would just let everything hang out. You would never be bringing all of your A-game to, to home. home. Right. And and my, really, what I hope I am doing is bringing my A-game to home every day. And yeah. doing, you know, to the best of my ability, trying to elevate, um, not just... I guess, I guess I would say that one of the ways that we would tie this all together is that we actually think that what's happening in individual homes is culturally really relevant. Yeah, and, and it's something that a mom needs to be prepared for because it's an important job. And so um, we yeah, want but... our girls to get an education. So basically, like, I, I have met people before who think, well, my girls, I just they just want to get married and have kids, so why would we need to educate them? Right. As if, as if being a mother at home is a brainless, menial task. And the thing that, that I think is so ironic about this is that the feminists dismiss homemaking as a brainless, menial task. And then they react away from it. They want to go out in the workplace and they want to find themselves and fulfill themselves somewhere else. And then weirdly, a lot of the time, conservatives... Um, agree with the feminists. It's a brainless menial task, but then they react to it emotionally on a different, in a different way. So they say, right, we're happy with it being brainless and menial. Embrace like brainless and menial. my life is really fulfilled by brainless right. menial tasks. Right. Instead of saying, why did we buy that? Why did we buy that this takes no, yeah. no like intellectual to, like, skill or... Yeah, reject the feminist. Um, I think we've let them define the terms for the last century and then conservatives when they're trying to to say no we're going to recapture that um we're going to do the opposite of what the feminists do they still have bought into the lie which is that this is um basically minimum wage position here that yeah. doesn't require I'm okay with it because I'm so lame too like it's all yeah. just going to be so lame <laughs> and right. and that a snuggie <laughs> is actually the only appropriate garment for this job <laughs> like that basically yoga pants and snuggies that's it that's what I'm yeah. worth that's yeah. what I'm that's right. what this or is or a calico dress right this is this is hard to this is hard to express in a short thought when God says, to whom much is given, much is required, when we give all sorts of things to our children, we're not trying to give it to them so nothing will be asked of them. Like It's like that offering of our life poured into theirs is asking God to demand much of them. Like, to say, like, we're yeah. raising the bar on our children. And that's not a... That's not a featherweight thing to be doing. You know, like, this is a responsibility that we're giving our children. And I just think, I don't know why. Uh, it's like people devalue children so much that they think they don't need someone with who's well-educated to explain the world to them. They don't need someone who knows about literature to read them fun little kids' books, you know, to do Sandra right. Boynton. It's like, but actually... They thrive with that. They thrive with, with, you know, talking. I don't know. I just think my kids have probably heard. It's not like I'm pulling up all of my old history notes about the Peloponnesian Wars <laughs> or anything. Uh, I I am because I have to yeah, teach yeah, yeah, the Peloponnesian War But I mean, right it's now. not like those are the things that I'm reflecting on all day, every day. But the discipline of having gone through those things is being applied still in my life every day. Yeah, except I would add too, though. I think, well, we do this when we talk on the phone all the time. We'll be cleaning the house or doing the laundry or whatever. And we do tend to to kind of reflect on it in a bigger way than just, oh, yeah. wait, what Rubbermaid bins could I use to solve this problem? It's more like, what's the, okay, oh, what are yeah. we doing? What's the point? What are mothers for? What is, how is the home significant? What can we be doing to reclaim culture? 
um, what's the role of the home in that? Well, one thing that I, what I was trying to say is shaping culture is I don't just mean just with the people who are in your home. It's like one thing that I have noticed as life has gone on is that the, the force of a woman in a home really pouring her life out, raising children, making good food. It's like, who was it that said of Edith Schaefer that she saved as many people with her cinnamon rolls as Francis <laughs> saved with his arguments that it was like her hospitality and her kindness and her, uh, turning what she believed into warm cinnamon rolls. But see that, that is hugely significant. And I think it's worth like stopping to, to like parse that a little bit because Men, um, well, obviously men and women are different, but they're called ultimately to the same end goal, but we do it very differently. And men tend to affect change by fiat. So they say, here's how we're going to do it. They lay it out and... Well, you can hear people driving by. That's good. That's <laughs> that good. was actually a powder blue <laughs> van. van. Anyway, <laughs> uh, rumbling past us. <laughs> they tend to do it by fiat, where they where they say, "Here's how we're going to do it." Point A, point B, point C. You know, and everybody's expected to fall into line, and that is a very important role. But when women, um, I think what women are made to do is to make it beautiful, make it winsome, make it attractive. I would say that men maybe do it by fiat, and then there's a lot of arguing and discussing around that because it's not like they just say something and, and everybody everyone does it. Well, it depends on but, the man. But, yeah, no, you're right. Where it's if like he's really king of the mountain, but he see, can just say it and everyone will do it. But if he's trying to be king sure. of the mountain. But in the same way that um, I think women are called to do the same thing, but we put flesh on it. And so I think we take the truth and then we make it smell like something. So basically like the husband, let's say your husband is the primary uh, breadwinner. He brings some the paycheck. You turn it into a hot meal that smells amazing and feeds people. Right. And, and I've said this before that what you're talking about is that uh, if you were going to parallel this, that the father is like a, uh, God to the church and the, and the, and the woman in the marriage, it's like Christ in the church, right? So if you think about it that way, the church is busy here on earth with the physical needs of people with like, who's the sick, who's the hungry, who needs help and ministry of people. But if the church is not connected to actually connected to Christ, then all of that work is kind of in vain. But if the church is, is totally connected to Christ, all of that work is preaching the gospel. Every part of this yeah, is, but it also needs to be thoughtful. Like it needs, you need to be doing what you're doing for a reason and you need to know what that reason is. And hopefully you realize that what you're doing is hugely important. And so of course you should study it, pursue it, try to get better at it. And, and I think women are especially geared to taking an academic concept, you know, or an abstract concept and then making it concrete. And so like, I've talked about this before, but Christmas is a really good example of this because you have the incarnation is one of the most complicated theological truths to get your head around, right? Theologians, church fathers, church councils, all trying to get, you know, get really precise uh, language describing the incarnation, but then the women make it, um, turn okay. it into Christmas. I know what we, what turn we should it do. Into Let's have big socks that are full of surprises. Candy canes <laughs> and presents, and you, you make it real for your children, and you teach them the incarnation, but you teach them with all of the smells and the nostalgia that they will always associate with it. And that's, that's mediated to them through the mother. So I think it's, um, well, for of instance, course women should know what they're trying to translate. We are the translators and you can't translate right, if you don't like, understand one side of it. If you think that this sounds bizarre or like too weirdly deep, if think of any cultural signatures that you know of, like the deep South is all the sweet tea and shelling beans and having, you know, fried chicken, but it's all so connected with what the women were doing. Like, uh, like there's yeah. a real cultural heritage behind it. There's, you know, real stuff there, but it's all been translated into biscuits, which is not really the cultural heritage, but it's so bound up in it 
for it, everyone it that also, they're like these are this is who we are this is where i'm from yeah, is who collard you are greens. is the food yeah yeah it's so true and and it's like and i know because we we lived abroad for three years in england like i said earlier and the thing that you miss is the familiar smells the familiar food and um and so that was a that was a hurdle to get over and actually now of course it works the other way now we miss the stuff that became fun there part yeah. of our life there but the point is is that yeah when you picture italy what are you picturing you know you're picturing mm-hmm. the these are the things and it's not enough it's not it's different to say there are different seasons in a woman's life. So I can remember because I believe these things because I care about culture building and I care about all of this. There was a time I think I was probably pregnant. I was definitely emotional, which is probably why I was pregnant. <laughs> I was, maybe I had a newborn. I don't know. I remember telling my husband, I was just like, oh my goodness, I what kind of a mom never even makes homemade cookies for her kids? Because I was thinking I'm not doing enough. You know, it was like, I'm trying, I care about these things. I'm not doing enough. And he was like, it's okay. First, you have to make the kids who will eat the cookies. There will be time <laughs> later to make the cookies, which is funny. Shows you how weirdly emotional I was being that that was the main concern. <laughs> Instead of being able to just go make a batch of cookies, because you're like, oh, I haven't done yep. that in a while. No, you're gonna have Instead a- of being that reasonable, it was an existential moment, a crisis <laughs> of I'm not even the woman I meant to be. I'm not even <laughs> making cookies. But the, there are definitely different seasons. So while it's fine, it's fine if you're in a season of eating box mac for whatever reason or you're in a season that's fine but it's not enough it's not enough of a goal or a desire to just get through your life at home with as little beauty as little effort as little like real motivating driving yeah good like we mentioned in a previous episode about um quilts and the beauty of of what those early pioneer women were doing Mm-hmm. But it is something that is such an effort that you're putting forward that it lasts. That yeah. it, it like goes on on the it goes on as something that your children have been shaped by. That they have been like that the beauty is compelling in some way. And there is some yeah. element, a blend of the sacrifice of a life with the beauty that that produces that is very powerful. And I think too there's it's so important um to a not be embarrassed of the domestic, like that's that's the first thing. Like, like so don't do apologize. You work? Yeah, don't apologize for the domestic because <laughs> that's just granting the ridiculous feminist premise that well, home there's no anything. And you've got to be home. honest that every person in the world wishes they had that. Yeah, they might not want to be the person who does it. But they wish they had it. Right. And the thing is, is, um, so that's the first thing is, is don't be like embarrassed or apologetic of the domestic. But the second thing is it actually, I, the feminists have a point in that it is easy to sink down to the lowest common denominator at home. It is very easy. If a woman wants to be an underachiever, you can do it at home. And so that's why it's really important, I think, to be pushing yourself all the time Um, to get better, get better at the things you're doing. Like you have to feed everybody every day anyway, right? Why not get better at it? Why not put effort into it? Um, And not be the kind of person who's always just looking for what's the bare minimum I can do? What's the time-saving devices that will ensure that I have the whole afternoon to sit on Pinterest? I want to say something. Something just occurred to me, which is um, that's related. I think you and I have this assumption, but I want to make sure we spell it out, which is that it's not a Christian approach to life to be keeping track of what you're doing in the balance with other people to be, and and that that's a real stumbling block for many people in the domestic front is that there, it's like they have a continual scale going and they're like, well, I did this. So my husband owes me that. And I did this. So he has to do this. And instead of the Christian model for life really should be everyone giving it all and not keeping track and realizing you answer to God, not like, right. Like, so your husband didn't take the garbage out or so your husband comes home and wants to put his feet up for a minute because he's fried from his yeah. day or he put his socks on the floor. How dare he? Darn him. How dare he? <laughs> um, 
But that the Christian approach to life is not one of keeping a little no. black book of things that no. people are not doing it's to how help. How can I spend myself for everyone? How? Yeah, and and how can I do that? And this is why I say that um, we had a real advantage of having parents who were that way for us, and yeah. so that was a something that was set, I think, in our minds as an assumption, which is, um, you know. I guess it's, we end to, tend to not under, I guess it's just easy to assume that everyone would think that way, but it is not, it is not thought that way often. But I think of those, um, champagne glass towers where they pour champagne into the top one and it, yeah, and it trickles down, down and right. it, until it's filled hundreds of glasses. And I think about that, like, you know, Jesus, like our salvation was free, but it wasn't free to God. It wasn't free to Christ. It no. wasn't free. Like that was a tremendous load that was carried by them to give us something freely. And so when we imitate Christ, that's what we're doing. It should cost us a ton yeah. and it should be free to them. Yes. And that, and not, not like kids, because I made this amazing dinner. Now you all owe me servitude for the rest. You know, like right. now you owe me. It's right. not that it's that I'm pouring freely to them so that they will overflow and not give it back to me necessarily. They'll right. be pouring it out to people to and like, yeah. so I'm not trying to get things by doing this. Well, I'm trying to give them. And one thing that a friend of mine said one time that I love is that she was feeling burned out, you know, exhausted, wiped, whatever. And she told her husband, I, my well has run dry. Like I have nothing left. I can't give, you know, like I am burned out as a mom. What poem is that? Till all the seas gang dry, my (laughs) love. Exactly. (laughs) All the seas seas have gang dry. They did. They ganged. (laughs) And uh, her husband said, but God didn't give you a well. He gave you a spring. And that is such an important like, I'm perspective. I'm looking in my little bucket and I see nothing that <laughs> I want to like, give. No, you can you can keep pouring it out because God right. has or given the, you a spring. Or the wonderful story of the widow who had no oil and it was like, go make bread. Like, go yeah. pour. And I have thought of that a lot, that she didn't know she had it until no. she was pouring. No, and like when the, you the start to pour, You're like, it turns yeah. out that when I yeah. got out of my bed and I started trying to bless people, I could. <laughs> Yeah. Turns out when I was laying in my bed refusing to pour anything, <laughs> I was not, surprisingly, blessing anyone. <laughs> that but that little is, bit of not like, doing it and didn't I produce fruit. When you have the perspective of like, you answer to God for this, not your children and your husband. Because because if you're looking at life horizontally, like what have I given to him and what has he given back to me? And what did I give to them and what did they ever do for me? Well, Partly you're you able have... to bury some files oh, yeah. when you do that. Big time. <laughs> you're, like... you're never looking at it accurately. But uh, if it's like, like the women who stay at home and husbands are at the office often have this assumption that their husband is off having a day of a fun and leisure. Yeah, yeah, like that all he's doing is loving every minute of his <laughs> life while he is actually just sitting at a desk probably right. being like not... Dealing with stress and everything. Dealing with his... the annoying yeah. co-workers and yeah. the difficult people and right. the... And but the, the emails is, he doesn't want to answer. I do think, I do think that if you realize God has given you money to invest, it's like the servants, you know, where the, the master gave them, you know, 10 talents, five talents, talent. Um, and you have this money and you have to answer to God for turning a profit on this. You don't have to answer to you know, like, I think I've done enough now because well, he and also didn't the take profit, the garbage out. The profit is often not as, it's not like a little vending machine. Sometimes you find out, and now I wish I could think of a good example of this, but sometimes you find out years and years and years later that some little thing you did that you don't even remember doing, God used yeah. in some way. Yeah. And, and you think, I didn't know at the time. God wasn't like, hey... These people are really not doing well, and they're going to stop by your house for something. So make sure you do something really considerate for them. Like, you don't know that. You don't have right. that heads up. In your mind, it may just be annoying drop-in visitors that are interrupting your plan. And it's like, well, whatever. You know, you offered them something, you did something, and if God uses it, or I, yeah. I would say he will use it. We won't necessarily know yeah. how. It's right. like if it's done in faith. Uh, if it's done in obedience, then right. God so, is using it. Which means if you're a if you're a mom at home, then that's the talent God gave you to invest. Turn a profit on it. Like, don't don't spend your time looking for the barest minimum things you can do and technically 
Um, you can check that box now. You've done the things. Because that, honestly, that is the mentality of a servant, not a master. It's it's a slave, not a free man. It's your, it's it's the mentality of somebody who's been given a checklist and you can check it off and now you're done for the day. But someone who like owns a business versus the employee in that business, they approach it very differently. And it's like, you need to approach your house and, and whatever it is that's been put in front of you, your children, your house, your husband, you have to have the mentality of, I am going to make this profitable, not, well, I did what I, you know, yeah, what or was I did enough that day. I feel like any Nobody jury of peers me. Yes. would find Nobody me. Nobody can blame me now because I did it. So now mm-hmm. I'm going to close up shop and, you know, just put my feet up. But well, I think to go back to the NSA thing, this yes. is not to say that the only way you can do this is if you have a college education at all. Of course, we're both very grateful for what NSA gave us. But, but if you're in a place where Mostly you didn't to get say that, it's not inconsistent with no, that. That's no. what we're trying to say is that invest your education or don't believe your work at home is not worth pursuing right. your education, not worth learning more. And right. And if you haven't, if you didn't have that, you know, you still have the ability to learn more, um, study more, find out more about God's creation, think more about the duties that are put in front of you. But we're just saying that like, it's not inconsistent for us to do a podcast for for a college that studies philosophy and well, theology, the college but we talk about us, knitting, but, you yeah. know what I mean? So, so we don't see that as an inconsistency. You should say though, that the college hey, is the powder there, blue band. There it goes with the broken tail light. <laughs> um, uh, I could see it seeming a bit funny to have Yeah, it. yeah, for sure. Becca, what's something in your life specifically that you had to, uh, that you decided to push through? Like, this is something we care about therefore because I would say both of us have done that with eating at the table as families that oh yeah that's a priority so even if there's extracurricular things oh man we find a way to do that's what we're going to be doing or that's going to be far and away the the um the dominant the dominant paradigm paradigm, for the day is that we eat as a family at the table very much um yeah, and you and you actually have to make an effort at that at some phases. Well, because... my word, so much effort during like track meet season oh, yeah. and basketball oh, yeah. games and all of that. We it just oh, not. And we had times where it was like drama and basketball, and it was high school girls and high school boys and junior high girls. So, so there's a Wasn't billion there, seasons. There's a meme going around that made me laugh. That was like everyone has practice, so we can eat at four thirty or nine. Oh yeah, well like, we those ate are at our nine. choices. Yeah, no, we did because my husband would be at work at four thirty, and I hate the like just throwing sandwiches at people here and there. So we just, if at all possible, we just made an effort to when everybody's home, whenever that may be. We will sit down and eat dinner together. And it actually was really kind of fun sometimes to sit down at 8.45. Yeah. Like and everybody finally made their way home again. And now we are going to sit down and eat. Yeah. And, of course, you know, you got to give them a snack somewhere early yeah. on. Yeah. We had a while with like, just our toast. oldest daughter having a practice in the middle of dinner time. And so f- we struggled for a little while trying to figure out a time and then realized, actually, it works fine. We just ate as a family and saved her a plate. Because everybody was still in the living room when she came home. It was like everybody was still yeah. hanging out and around and talking. And so she was not alone. She was still with people. Yeah. But we would yeah. not have wanted a, a a new format of her not being with the right. family. Yeah, right. Like, oh, here's a new thing. And I think it's... I I love, too, just what it says where it's like, no, we waited for you. Yeah, yeah. You know, like... like you're important. You're important. This, you're yeah. a part of the group. Of course, we're not gonna, you mm-hmm. know, do everything without you. And, of course, there's plenty of times where it's like, whatever, you're on a long bus ride. You're not gonna yeah, like, whatever. 11. We cut you yeah. out of this loop this time. <laughs> yeah, and then you have to figure out packable dinners and all of that. But, no, it's... There's, there's times when just making that effort. And now, even though we're grown, we already mentioned this once, but we go back to my parents' house every Saturday night and do a big dinner with... A billion people now and when it started there were just six of us and we would get together Saturday night and mom would make dinner and it became and at first it had to be a priority it was like remember we're gonna do this on Saturday night mm-hmm. but it took no time before that became the non-negotiable of the week oh my kids are so bummed if we're for some no, reason not gonna be back happen, in time they're like 
What? It throws We're off the rhythm Sabbath? so much. We're missing Sabbath? What are we going to do? We actually, I mean, we plan our trips as much as possible to avoid yeah, missing we be Sabbath back. dinner. We want to be back. And, and that's a great example of what we were saying earlier, which is just the woman... Um, by laying it all down, because that is not easy, I must say, for mom to cook no, for that many all. people every week and have that many people in her I house. I always say, we do try to help. We, we do, do help. We do. But there's no doubt that we leave I just feel a, like when we... She we leave definitely a makes it happen. <laughs> but I like that... I just want you all to know that we don't leave we do. her alone to no, feed us we all. We do help. We help. But... Um, no, but, but that's really been, I think, an unexpected thing for her, that that's been sort of that that really is going to be her legacy. Like, more than, like, that... I don't think going into it, that's what she thought it would be. Like, I don't think she was in any way... And this last week, we had, like, the bare bones, like, people were gone crew. (laughs) 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 Becca just took her last big swig of her coffee, and it was a bunch of grounds. Really nasty. So funny. Oh. Oh, man. So that was good. Anyway, Um, I'm glad you didn't have to see that. Because yeah. it was gross. Well, she's making quite the horrified face. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I guess we would say that wherever you are, whatever you're, whatever you have to work on, you know, think about what would really bless your family. What are things that would really delight them? Like, what are things yeah. that you should... And never, ever feel like your brain isn't is involved. disconnected. Yes. Yes. The, the, because... You should be learning more. Find out more. The world is huge. We don't have enough time to learn it all. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, and I think I've worked my way through kitchen things where I'm like, I will, like, when we were engaged, maybe, is when I made bazillions of batches of chocolate chip cookies until oh, it was like, it. until I could make the chocolate chip cookie that was my husband's favorite chocolate chip yeah. cookie. It was I like, did the same thing. What is your favorite you know, like we just kept trying it over and over. And this was, I wanted to know he was not rejecting my cookies or being like, try again, woman, <laughs> <laughs> do better next time. But I wanted to know that if I wanted to make his favorite cookie, that yeah. I could make ex- exactly the cookie that I wanted. And, and then I did that with that bagels. I, think... I did it with biscuits for bread. a while. Oh, I did it biscuits. with bread. Yeah. I did it with pizza. We've been I on the did biscuit it... journey. For sure. Yes, and all of those things are things that I've gone through. Like, I want to be a mother who can make the food that I meant mm-hmm. to make for people. The one that I have consistently failed at, and I have tried, and I sh- now I'm being convicted. We should do it again. But I can't fry chicken. I can't. I've done it. I've done it a lot of different ways, a lot of different times. But Ben had a grandma who could just fry the chicken, and it was like the <laughs> idyllic fried chicken. And I don't know. I don't have the spiritual Becca, gift. I have that. I have a recipe for you for that. I just read that book, at, um, Home Cooking by Laura Colwin or Lori Colwin. Or yeah. something. It's from the 80s. But she has the recipe for fried chicken in it that is well, hilarious. Well, I even talked to the grandma. And she was very sure that there was nothing to it. And so she was <laughs> like, well, you just fry the chicken. Yes, but you should read this because it's funny. And she has the, I loved her closing lines to that was that. Congratulations. It was like, you will have done it. Like, you have fried chicken now, and you have suffered. And it was like, (laughs) because there will be, no matter what, there's grease everywhere in your kitchen. You will smell like fried chicken for three days. Mm -hmm, It was like, mm -hmm. it's a pain, but it's delicious, and it's worth it. But see, this is where I think I stall out, is the fact that I don't really like fried chicken. Yeah, it's hard to catch a vision for something that you don't like. Yeah, when you don't, because I, I peel the skin off. Like... I would much rather eat a boneless, skinless chicken breast than a fried chicken leg. Like, I really don't love it myself. So it makes it kind of hard for me to... Maybe that's your first step. Yeah. Begin to love fried uh, chicken. It's hard. I really don't yeah. like skin on chicken. I like the concept of fried chicken. And, and, yeah. and the There's example, some poetry there. Yeah. In the example of this just do weird things, I had I did this with fried chicken where I was like, why haven't I fried chicken correctly? What's my problem? But for somehow I felt like I had to start with the whole chicken. I had to cut the thing oh, up. Oh, of course you did. So we got the chicken chicken i i cut that thing it. into pieces and soaked it in the buttermilk and did yeah, the whole I've done that. shenanigans i've done the stovetop i've done the oven version okay I've... but this in this book she specifically says you have to have a chicken fryer like the pan oh man okay. no 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 it's not it's the pan with the taller sides and a lid because you basically it cooks for a long time covered where it is cooked. in the oil 
Yeah, it cooks, oh. and that way it cooks all the way to the bone, so it's not raw, but yeah. then you take the lid off and it crisps right. it. But I think typically people either get the right amount of crisp with raw chicken on yeah. the indoors. Yeah, or it's like, yeah. But it's an art form. It and is I liked an art it. She form. said that it was like her nanny who taught her. I know, her and southern see- nanny taught her, and she said, that woman whose chicken fryer I was not worthy to touch. <laughs> Well, and then there's the gravy, like they make gravy. I don't know. I just, I, I don't have so that. So next time yet. when we come back, I'm gonna look for a special report on yeah on Becca's whether or not. fried chicken journey. Has she improved? <laughs> I or doubt not? it, because this journey has been like 15 years. Well, you've got a week now to try yeah, something up to nail it. Yeah. Anyway, we've been it. here too we've long. We've been here way too long. We've okay. Just been talking too. So much. that's what we have. What have you? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go. Bye.